about the company for which you'll be writing your marketing plans. Um, so yeah, having a bit of background to that company, understanding the industry they operate in, the changes in that industry, the challenges they face, <laughs> is important material for you to use in your marketing. Having said that, there's also already some material on uh, Study Direct. There is links to industry websites, there is links to their website, and there are abbreviated uh, accounts are there too. So there, there is there some material too. But of course, their presentation uh, is somewhat unique, uh, and, and therefore it's important that you basically be there for you and pick up bits and pieces that you might want to use during your, um, during your discussions uh, about the market. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Paul Reed, James Cutperson. Paul is the Managing Director of Dark Star Room, and James is the Marketing Director of Dark Star Room. Right, good, good afternoon, good afternoon. I'm going to start with uh, really thank you, Renny, for giving me the chance to come and uh, talk with you, because one thing about working in a small business, a small entrepreneurial business, is you work and think pretty much 24-7. Um, about the business. So when you're given the opportunity to come and actually talk about it, well, I'll put it this way, you probably have to stop for me, you know what I mean? Because I assume that everyone's as interested as I am. Um, right, we did, as you saw, we caught the tail end of uh, Rene's uh, lecture. It's very detailed and reminded me of my, doing my MBA a few years ago. Um, well, uh, don't expect anything like this. It is, as Rene says, a unique presentation. It's so unique that I'm not even sure I know what the slides that uh, James has put together for me, so I'll kind of uh, we'll see how we go. Um, yes, I'm the I'm the MD, although the uh, for some reason I seem to be christened in the workplace the headmaster. I don't know whether that sort of whether they're telling me something that I'm patronising or something, or but I take it as a term of affection. Um, James is their James is their marketing. And um, now one of the things I did learn is that uh, is to do a good presentation, and I'm not saying for a second this is going to be one, um, but to do a good presentation you should tell people what you're going to say, then you say it, and then you tell them what you said. So listen, this is what we're going to, what I'm going to, what we're going to do. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a, a talk about what the business does, a bit about its history, about, about its growth, what it's doing at the moment. And then I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to tell you about what's happening in the big wide world, in the, you know, the sort of commercial environment that we that we work in. And I'm guessing that you can probably you'll probably be able to sort of put a timeline together and say, well, this is what Dark Star the business has done, while this is what the what the world has been doing. Um, right, the if I give you a very quick run through the history of the business now. Right here in Brighton, right almost in the centre of the town, up near the station, there's a little pub called the Evening Star. And in 1994, um, we decided to turn that into a brew pub. Now, this, um, this was to make a particular type of beer that's very, very unlike the Stellas and the Carlsbergs and the Guinnesses and all of those work. Very, very different. And it was tiny, tiny scale. I promise you, you could probably fit the little brewery, you know, um, you know, in your kitchen. I mean, it's, it, was, it was that tiny. And it didn't really make enough beer. Um, well, it didn't keep the pub satisfied. So it, it didn't have any customers. It didn't make enough money uh, to pay them any wages. Um, it was a hobby. It really was a hobby. I suppose the good thing about it was it was turning the pub into a brew pub, making it smell lovely of hops all the time, made the pub very popular. But, uh, yeah, it's sort of in, in 1994, 1995, it was probably turning over 10 or 15,000 pounds. So really not enough to pay anyone any wages, barely enough to cover the, the rent and the, and, and, and the cost of the materials. But I suppose what it did do is it did enable us to learn uh, our craft, learn about brewing beer, um, and brewing beer that, uh, that, were, that, were, that were different, not odd, but just different, perhaps, perhaps borrowing from traditions uh, that were you know, perhaps more like German beers or French beers or uh, beers from, from craft brewers in the United States. 
and we were bringing in hops and ingredients from all over the world. So that was really the purpose of that bit of their business, as it were, it was a sort of learning experience. But business got real in 2001 when we uh, when we moved the business business it wasn't business we moved we moved our brewery from the cellar of the uh, Evening Star to a purpose-built uh, brewery and increased their capacity by oh I don't know. 10 or 15 times or something. I mean, which seemed absolutely massive when we did that. Um, we uh, we invested quite heavily as year on year to increase our capacity until um, in 2009 we moved again to the brewery we're at at the moment, um, which is all oh, nice and big and shiny and lovely pictures. Um, which it, we're now we're now producing. Let me see, we're producing about 16,000 litres of beer a day. So, listen, that's still just a pimple compared to the very big brewers in the world, but that's more beer than I could drink. So, it's, you know, it seems like, it's, it seems like a, a lot. We're, we're, now the, we're now the second, in volume terms, we're now the second biggest brewer in Sussex. Um, and, and we, 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 this year we're hoping to have a, turn, a turnover of around about six million. Now, that growth, um, that growth to you guys, you probably think, well, that's nothing particularly phenomenal. Look at, look at, look at Apple, look at Google, look at all these other uh, tech businesses. But actually, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a traditional manufacturing business, and they don't come much more traditional in manufacturing than brewing, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, James. Now, let me tell you, just digress just a second, perhaps, unfortunately, I'm digressing into James' area just, just, just slightly, because if I just explain the traditional way that brewers grow and develop, what happens is the brewery is founded, it supplies its local geographic area, it then supplies, as it grows, it gets a little more competitive and it expands a little bit. Then it starts doing deals with pub companies, so it can start distributing its beer into any one of their pubs. Uh, it does deals with other brewers as well, so that that, that other brewer can have you know, a, a different uh, a beer. Um, we've never done that. We've never done that. Our model has always been that we uh, we market directly to the consumer. So all of our effort is spent talking with the consumer. I'm not saying we I'm not saying we ignore the trade, that middleman, we don't ignore them. Um, but that's not the focus of our communication. So whereas other brewers might be doing crazy deals with distributors, whatever it is, you know, three for two or you know giving away umbrellas to pubs or whatever it might be to get their beer into the trade. We've never done that. And what that has meant is that um, we get this split of our distribution, which is probably unlike any other brewery, where the biggest chunk, three quarters of our beer, we distribute ourselves into individual pubs throughout the southeast of the country. Um, 18% going through distributors who will likewise distribute it to pubs, only they'll take it wider, they'll, they'll take it to the, to the four corners of the country. And a tiny bit, 6% into our own pubs. We've got three of our own pubs, we've still got the Evening Star I mentioned, we've got a couple of other pubs as well. So there's a split. In actual fact, um, I think I might say we've got, we've got something over a thousand customers. Um, I also, these are some of the <coughs> brands, I don't like that word when I'm talking about traditional beer, but nonetheless, these are, these, are, these are our brands of beer, if you like, so Hophead, American Pale, we produce about 25 different beers in the course of the year. Now if you look at these numbers, you'll say, you say well, why on earth do you do that? Why do you do that? Look. In the top three beers, the top, the top three beers, there's 80% of your production. Why bother with the rest? It wouldn't life be simple <coughs> if you just did this. Well, I think the message is, I think, I'll give you two answers to that. 
One is because we're mad about beer. Of course, we need to make a living, but actually what we're in this business for is because of the love affair we have with beer. And all the time there's another style of beer out there that we haven't produced yet. That will keep us going, you know, producing more and more beers. The other thing, so that's one answer, the other answer is, well, it's about the personality of the business. Because our consumers love us, not just because there's some beers there they like, but because we, they see us as innovators. I mean, I love being called an innovator as a compliment. I mean, I take compliments from anyone. But in truth, we're really copycats. In truth, a lot of the beers that we make are what we hope to be really, really good copies of styles of beer. Styles of beer that you don't normally see, um, you know, in your local pubs. Um, Blimey, that's me done. Okay, James, over to you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about the big picture, and that is in fact a big picture. Um, that's made of toast. I thought it was really weird when I saw it this morning. So 10,000 different slices. So I was looking to turn for the big picture. I thought that would do me. Um, I want to talk to you a bit. I'll start by sort of saying that there'll be some things that we take for granted about pubs and about beer. The beauty of that is that we take them for granted and don't really know what they are. So I'm going to kind of give you a little history lesson as to how the market has formed really. Um, some of the points I'm going back to, um, only Paul here will remember, um, but I still have books to refer to, so I'll, uh, I'll go on that. Um, so it's a whistle stop tour. So, if I take you back to 1970, essentially beer, or real beer as we know it, was absolutely <coughs> dying. Um, then came along a group that were really passionate about beer called Camera, the Campaign for Real Ale. I don't know if any of you have, uh, have heard of those. But Camera, if you're looking at it, you'll see on some of the supporting material. Um, that was four guys who said that um, they were kind of disillusioned by what was happening in the market. They were just set a couple of brewers producing pretty much the same beer, so there was no choice out there. Um, in the present day, Camera has 150,000 members, and um, they describe themselves, I should say, as being the most successful consumer campaign in, in Europe. And I have to say, without whom, we wouldn't be here today, and we wouldn't be drinking the diverse range of beers that we have. About five, and a, about five and a half thousand different beers being produced in the UK right now. That's real ale. Um, so coming forward from uh, 1970, 1971, when Camera was formed, we come to 1989, and that's another really key time for us. I think called the beer orders. Now, the beer orders <coughs> were set by the Secretary of State, State uh, for Industry, um, and it was calling time on the large brewers. What there was, and they described it as an unhealthy relationship between brewers producing the beer, but they also owned the pubs. So what they didn't like was effectively this monopoly situation where they set the prices. So there was a cut. The beer orders were set, and there was a ceiling set at 2,000. So a brewer, a big brewer like Green King, who you may have heard of, they could have 2,000 pubs, and that was it. So what this did is, it was a kind of gold rush, really, because these guys had to shed their pubs real quick. So the market, as it does, develops. We talk about changing with the market. So things called pub codes were set up. These effectively were property companies, um, backed, venture capitalists backed in, in, in the main, and there'll be pun, there'll be names like Punch and Enterprise Inn, so again, back in those days, were very much the darlings of the city. Um, these guys were acquiring freehold assets, not running them, having agreements, trade agreements with these brewers, and then setting these up as leases. So they'd buy the freehold, then they'd sell the lease to you or I, we'd pay a premium, we'd start to run that business. Which I find really interesting, because soon pubcos um, were growing at a tremendous rate. And whilst the beer orders were actually stopped in 2003, now you're in a situation where some of these big pub companies have like 6,000 pubs. And they have trading agreements, and they have mass buying with the big brewers. So I'm not really sure I see the difference, and there's probably a prize if anyone can really tell me the difference, other than the fact that the government aren't looking at it right now. They're concentrating on things like binge drinking, which we'll come on to in a wee bit. So, um, something else exists in that relationship between the property owner and you or I, the licensee who are running these pubs, called the tie. This tie means that effectively, for a rent, you take on your pub, and when you're in your pub, you have to buy from your landlord or the, or the company. So what that means, again, is they're tied in, the clues in the name, to what they can buy. So, very quickly, again, there was a bit of disquiet about this, and there's been a movement now to stop this second wave of beer orders coming, there's a bit of self-regulation going on. 
where pub companies are actually allowing individual pubs, and it's emerging, to start what they call buy out. But buy out out of this tie to keep a nice breadth of product on the bar and not have this same situation where they're regulated and told they're going to change again and ship pubs. So a bit of kind of self-regulating going on the market is really interesting because at the same time um, that we're growing, pubs now have the opportunity to buy our products and not be tied to these big brewers. So there's a real opportunity for, for businesses like our small brewers to come in and take advantage of this. A really key point that comes in at the same time of that is kind of a change in consumer behaviour. Um, we've certainly noticed it in, in our business it's helped us thrive and that people are being turned off by big brands, big beer brands. So what we're seeing is that there's much more, if we look back at the rise of, sort of, rise of the organic movement, which I think there's some sort of, you know, you all have an opinion on that right now, but people are certainly more interested in what they're, what they're consuming, food and drink right now. So they want to know about provenance, you know, where it's from, ingredients were, and this market's kind of grown with that. So this craft beer sector, which is, oh, this craft beer market, which is kind of a relatively new, new phrase, um, came from America, typically as things do, um, and there was a great rise, an eye-watering rise in brewers over there after Prohibition. There were like four, and now there are thousands and thousands of brewers there. We're kind of in the same situation here. It's happened in America, it's happening here. So in Sussex, when the Dark Star business was formed back in 94, there were four brewers, Right now, coming today, we're 40 odd brewers in Sussex and Rome growing quickly. So that's kind of where we are to a point. But the really interesting point is this craft brewing movement um, over here. So I just wanted to kind of maybe look, take, look at that a bit more when you do your research. But there's a real rise of that. Where it's going to stop, we don't really know. There are some models to go and look at, um, which I think are interesting. America goes from strength to strength. There's no, there seems to be no. Um, reduction appetite for craft beer in America. Um, however, if you look in Scandinavia, there was this same rise, but then it fell off a cliff. And we're trying to work out what's interesting, because that American model looks quite interesting, we'd like that to keep happening. The Scandinavian one's quite <coughs> concerning, because what happened was that everyone jumped into the brewing market, and actually what happened was that the consumer's experience of beer wasn't great, because there were these brewing guys doing it early on, but then when everyone thought they could do it, Actually, the consumer got turned off. So the quality of beer was mediocre. The broad range got turned off. The market died. It's since started to pick up again with the very best operators surviving. But I think it's an interesting one um, to look at. So I'll offer you one more dynamic in this whole thing. We've talked about the rise of these brewers coming on strong and the appetite continues, the thirst continues for them. The pubs, so where we're distributing our beer, are closing at an, uh, an alarming rate. So our market, if you like, is shrinking real quick. 30 to 50 pubs a week are closing down. So we should be really scared about that, shouldn't we? Because that's where people buy our beer. So something's happening in there that's, that's making, meaning that we're still surviving, yet our marketplace is going down. What's happening there is that people being turned off from the big brands, I mentioned that before, we're seeing lager sales, so cake beer, we're seeing that falling off a cliff. So at the minute we've kind of got craft beer doing that, keg, big fizzy lager, yellow stuff doing that, and at some point it has to settle down. The real key is to know when that's going to happen, when you keep taking market share. My final social dynamic I'll let say is binge drinking. So this week we're talking about drunk tanks. Um, there's lots of movement that comes about. It's binge drinking, it's relationship with crime. As yet, craft brewers, us guys, have avoided that gaze. They're pretty much looking at brands like Stella. Um, uh, you'll have heard the phrase wife beater branded about that, but there's lots of bad press about those premium lagers. So far, we've managed to go under the radar on that and, so, and, and, and sort of continue to grow nicely. But again, you must be aware that alcohol is a drug, um, and we need to be, it's an important part to play in our, in, in our little environment that we, uh, that we work in. So, it would appear that our challenge is to broadly look small and beautiful and crafty without getting too big, but equally we want financial success. So with that comes clearly the wrapping up of production and going from the basement of the pub into the plant that we, uh, that we looked at earlier. Um, that's broadly it for me. That gives you hopefully a little outline of where we, where we are. I've heard all my slides, which is good for you. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Um, yeah, th thanks for that, James. You, you probably listened to the bit I said and said, well, this is easy, isn't it? You know, then he's just describing a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of individuals having a lot of fun and, and, and uh, you know, building a business along the way. And thanks so much for that. Then along comes James and actually paints in some of the complexity. Um, now, um, have we, you know, have, have, have we been lucky up to now and managed to have the right product in the right place at the right time? Um, you know, were we, you know, are we, are, were we, were we put where we are because, you know, because of the, the move in the marketplace? I mean, this is all kind of interesting, most philosophical talk. But nonetheless, nonetheless, the point is, James and I have invested whatever it is, half an hour into, uh, well, half an hour into giving this presentation about two minutes in the car park. Uh, so we've invested some of our time in telling you guys, um, you know, about our business and, and you know, where we've come from and how we've got to where we are. Now it's your job because uh, you're now going to come back and tell us what our marketing strategy is going to be going forward over the next five years. That's it. Over to you. thing I think James touched upon it is there also seems to be a niche is now splitting into two niches in that in the, you had the you had the uh, the real ale which was uh, you know, which was which was a, a group of its own now that seems to be subdividing you're getting the sort of craft beer real ales and whatever against the others now I'm not sure in my own head how I can define what the difference is it seems to be it's whatever you want to call yourself all I can say is of the now, 40 brewers there are in Sussex alone. Um, all of those will be saying they're craft brewers, handcrafted, and all of these sorts of things. So it's as if they were, they we're on the cusp of yet another niche forming out of the niche. certain sectors, so at the minute we're doing a lot with cycling because this kind of lifestyle of things are really important to us. So we're, um, we're engaged in the cycling community, we're sponsoring um, different events, we're running events, spin up events in, in our brewery. So I think actually we'll find our own niches and keep to work, keep working with them. But as a brand we have to be responsible, clearly we're dispensing alcohol, so that's really mindful. We have to be mindful of the link with, with kids, so we don't want to be accused of marketing to children, so another interesting dynamic. So, um, I think we're becoming, we, we want to become part of people's lifestyle. So that's. Could I also say that you, you remember when I the word brands appeared on the presentation and I cringed ever so slightly? I think James is maybe a bit more comfortable with that, uh, with that term than I am. And, and why that is, is that, is that our, our marketing model has always been, uh, is it like here, let's say the no, no sales sales or something like that? We have the no marketing market. And the reason for that is that our core consumers don't like being marketed to. Okay, so if we if we suddenly took out full page colour ads in Sunday supplements or something like that, that would actually turn them off. And that's because they like to discover the products themselves. Okay, that's the if you I'll give you just a little insight into, into our core consumer. Probably one of the one of the uh, one of their greatest pleasures is Chatting to uh, you know, chatting to each other about the different beers they've had and where they've had them, 
and the old way on the occasions and who they were with and all of these things. So the last thing on earth they want to do is to belong to some sort of club where they where they you know they have the they have the glass and the t-shirt and all this sort of stuff and all their mates are really excited. So it's a very delicate balance where we've got to market to people who don't want to be marketed. Words. I need just a few seconds to explain the process of viewing. Because there's a video which is on the background reading that is on the study director. There's a tour of the brewery. Why just a few words to explain the actual process? Yeah, you guys got anybody to go to this afternoon? Because uh, <laughs> it's. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so, uh, yeah, beer, beer is derived from uh, fermenting the sugars that come from malted grains. Um, it's, a, it's an age-old technology, I don't know when, hundreds of years. Um, and in fact, in fact, the first beers that were made were simply that. They would, they would, uh, they would extract the starches from the, from the grains, then by, an enzyme, by using enzymes that turn that into sugar. Somebody then discovered a happy accident, somebody discovered that if you put hops in beer, um, it preserves the beer, it keeps it a, a bit longer. Um, but it also makes it taste a lot better as well. So hops essentially are a mixture of water, yeast to do the work, hops and malt. That's it, four simple ingredients. Now brewers have got it quite easy when it compared to say cider makers or wine makers. Those two industries are very highly regulated as far as what they can do and still call it wine, or still call it cider, or still call it perry. Um, brewers have got it a lot, a lot easier. So that's enabled them to actually make quite a, a wide variety of beers. Beers with things you know added in, things you've all come across, ginger beer and this sort of thing. But I mean it can be it can use herbs and spices and all sorts of things. And um, also I, I run over very quickly that um, you know it's, it's, it's it's grain and it's hops. Well, it is, um, but also it, it, it can be barley, it can be rye, it can be wheat, it can be oats, and all of those things will bring different characteristics to the beer. And likewise, the hops, there's, I don't know, several hundreds of different varieties of hop grown commercially throughout the world, and each of them will have a different characteristic. It can bring a different aroma, taste, bitterness to the beer. So there is a near infinite number of different beers you can make by the combination of those those four ingredients. I don't know. Dark Star. I can't explain it, but listen, you're of an age just to go straight over your head because it dates back to um, Rob Jones, one of the co-founders of the business. He used to be a brewer in a different, uh, for a different brewery. He produced a beer, um, uh, and they didn't know what to call it. Somebody uh, walked into the brewery, and this is this is early 70s, I think, um, and wearing a hippie T-shirt.